Hey Bethel, it's great to be with you today. We are so glad to be gathered together with you in this Thanksgiving week. We have so much to be grateful for. Hey, a couple things I'd like to remind you about today before we begin worship. First off is a reminder of today's business meeting out in Battle Lake. Uh, and there are a lot of details, and I'm going to ask Kate to give those to you because she's really good at details. So, Kate? Hey Bethel, we have an exciting opportunity before us for our Battle Lake campus. As we pursue a long-term option for a facility in Battle Lake, uh, we have recently been given the opportunity to purchase uh, the 10-acre tract of land behind the Dollar General right off of 78. Um, this is really exciting. Uh, the opportunity is to purchase that land for $100,000. The really exciting news is we've been given a gift from a donor to make that purchase possible. The benefits of this land are many. It's a large piece of land, so there's lots of room for growth and expansion for a Battle Lake campus. There's plenty of room for parking, there's lots of green space, uh, and it's great visibility due to the higher elevation of that land uh, as it relates to the other land around it. So we are really excited about this opportunity. Uh, we invite you to be a part of that today. Uh, there's a meeting at noon in Battle Lake where we can discuss all of these options with this opportunity and make some decisions for our Battle Lake campus. And tonight, we are looking forward to gathering in Fergus Falls as well. This evening, we gather for our Thanksgiving community worship service at the Fergus Falls campus at 6 p.m. This is going to be a wonderful time of worship, uh, testimony, giving, and prayer. It's a time to gather uh, for worship, to give thanks to the Lord for who He is and all that He's done. After the service, there's going to be coffee and cider and pie, uh, so delicious snacks, treats around the table together. We look forward to worship and fellowship together, so we hope you can make it this evening at 6 p.m. So as we turn our attention to the Lord today, we can sing with confidence in his goodness and his provision. We have been given all we need through Jesus. That is the good news we have to sing and praise him for. We can do this as the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, says. Let's tune our hearts to sing his praise. Let's continue now in worship of him together. Well, greetings to those of you joining us today. Um, maybe you're joining us online or at Bethel Battle Lake. Uh, welcome. Glad to be with you today. Um, grow up. That's, a, that's what kids uh, want to do. Every kid wants to, to grow up. And grow up is what, uh, what we tell kids to do when they're little. Um, Shel Silverstein uh, is, uh, as you might expect, someone who sees things uh, from a, an entirely different perspective. Uh, he has a poem called Growing Down. And it, and it and it reads like this. It starts out like this. Mix a grunt and a grumble, a sneer and a frown, and what do you have? Why, old Mr. Brown, the crabbiest man in our whole darn town. We all called him Grow Up Brown. For years, each girl and boy and pup heard, grow up, grow up, grow up. He'd say, why don't you be polite? Why must you sh shout and fuss and fight? Why can't you keep dirt off your clothes? Why can't you remember to wipe your nose? Why must you always make such noise? Why don't you go pick up your toys? Why do you hate to wash your hands? Why are your shoes all filled with sand? Why must you shout when I'm lying down? Why don't you grow up, grumped grow up brown? Uh, sounds like a really kind of cranky old guy, the kind of guy you don't want to be when you get old, right? Uh, Today we're going to see in the text we're going to look at in Scripture that the Apostle Paul, who is no cranky old guy, is talking to the group of Christians in the church in Ephesus, and his message to them is basically, grow up, you guys. You all need to grow up. Maturity is what he wanted for the believers in Ephesus. So I'm going to invite you to reach for a Bible and uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking today at the first 16 verses of this chapter, Ephesians 4. 1 through 16. Would you up? Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Thank you. I'll start at verse 1. Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body... And one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father over all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says, when he ascended on high, and he's quoting from the Psalms here, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this, your word. Uh, Thank you for this concern on the part of the Apostle Paul that that the church, that the believers in Ephesus mature, that they grow up. Lord, we want the same for us today. We have not yet arrived. We are still growing. You're still leading us and growing us. So uh, do that work in us today, we pray. And use your word to do that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us. Um, Use this word in our lives for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Okay, I, I, want, to, I want to draw attention at the start of the message today to, to two things that are in the text. Um, uh, one, I want you to uh, notice with me the metaphor and the movement in the text. The metaphor is, is a body, and the movement is maturity. Okay, Paul says... That the church is a body. I mean, that is, is a body joined together, and Jesus is the head of the body. The body, the head is Jesus. Here's what he says in verse 15 We will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. And he's talking about now a body, and he says that the church is a body made up of parts, body parts. All kinds of parts, and all the parts work together. The fingers and the hands and the arms, torso, legs, feet, and toes, all of it working together. That's how they know how important each part is and how working together and staying together, being unified, as Philippians talks about unity and spirit and purpose, is really important. He says in verse 2 and 3, be completely humble and gentle, right? Because you're working with each other. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul's emphasis is on keeping the unity. He says the unity is what we have in Christ. We're united in Christ. We're made one body in Christ. Our job is to work hard to keep unified as a body together. That's the metaphor, a body, and that's the movement, maturity. Paul's concern is summed up in verse 12 and 13. He says that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Now, to grow up, to to mature, is is good, right? You all agree with that? To to become mature is, is a good thing. In fact, it's even normal, like, it's sort of normal. You sort of let time and circumstances happen and, and people mature over time. This is part of the process. In fact, to not grow, to not mature is unusual. And in fact, it is, it is dangerous. Um, 
Let me, let me give you an example of that. Um, how many of you have ever seen a picture of, of this guy? Take, take a look at this. Have you ever seen a picture of this guy before? This is Robert Wadlow. Now, I remember as a kid seeing a picture of this guy when I was a kid in the Guinness Book of World Records. Were you like me? Like, did you ever, like, when it was a book, like, you'd read the book and you'd see the pictures. I'd be like, oh, look at this. And the guy with the long fingernails and, you know, like, the whole thing, right? This is right. This guy was in all the pictures every year. This, he's the tallest guy to have ever lived. We don't have pictures of Goliath, all right? So next to Goliath, this guy, Robert Wadlow, has the Guinness Book of World Records for being the tallest guy to have ever lived. Get this. When he was 18 months old, he was four feet three inches tall. I'm like, seriously, that's like the size of an eight, eight-year-old, like a second grader at 18 months. When he was 10 years old, he was six foot five, 10 years old, six five. When he graduated high school, this is a picture of him, he was eight feet four inches tall. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He topped out at eight feet, 11 inches tall. Imagine that. Now that is growth. His shoe size was a 37. <laughs> his, his shoe size, let's like, his shoe size was a 37. But get this, his, inter, his body grew super tall. Uh, he was like 400 something pounds. His internal organs did not mature, did not grow, could not keep up with his body, and he died at age 22. Robert, Robert uh, Wadlow died at age 22 because while his body grew tall, his internal organs could not keep up with his body. How, how do you measure, how do we measure or predict growth? How do we know how tall, how big somebody's going to become? You know, physically speaking, uh, you used to have to go to the pediatrician and, and get information from the pediatrician on this kind of stuff. Nowadays, there's so many different methods you can find out how tall your kid's going to be, right? You, there's parents' height formulas, your mother's height, your father's height, and figure that. Or double your kid's age at age two, and that's probably what he's going to be. Or measure the circumference of the child's head. I mean, yada, yada. There's all kinds of, all kinds of things to decide whether or not your kid's got a shot at the NBA when he, when he or she grows up, right? But the... But the unit of measure that you use, what unit of measure do you use to measure spiritual growth? How do you predict that? How, what unit of measure is there to predict spiritual growth? It's not inches and feet. Paul says that the unit of measure for spiritual growth is unity. Let me say that again. The unit of measure for spiritual growth is Unity. And, and that is not at all surprising, because if you look from the beginning of this book, Paul's been talking about unity. We are found in Christ, and he's been building on this idea of unity in Christ. He talks about the unity that was purchased by the blood of Jesus for us. We're built together. We're stones, fit, fitted, shaped, all coming together. He builds on this for three chapters, and in chapter four, he hits it again. He says that our identity is in Christ, and we need to fight for that unity We've been given that unit. We need to maintain it in some translations or keep it here in the NIV. Listen again, starting at verse 2. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep, right, or maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you're called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Paul is really big on unity, right? He's really concerned about unity in the church. And the threat to our growth is disunity. The single biggest threat to our growth is disunity. What is that like? What does that look like? Pride instead of humility. Impatience instead of patience. Arguing instead of pursuing peace. Those are the threats to our spiritual growth as individuals who are part of a body together. And then Paul calls out some other impediments to spiritual maturity. Look at verse 14. This is a key verse. 
He says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. See, in this verse, he says that our growth is impeded by, by a couple of things, two things. The first, instability. Instability. Notice it with me. He says, again, then, you will, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Um, he uses the word infants here in the text. We'll no longer be infants. It actually, were, the word in the Greek is the word napios, and napios literally gets translated as ignorant or unlearned, foolish, kind of dumb, right? So literally, quite literally, it's then we will no longer be idiots. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. Now, I'd much rather be called a baby than an idiot. I don't know about you. But he says, they will no longer be idiots, right? Um, this is the instability of a child, the lack of understanding and knowledge. One thing children are not is stable. And Paul is talking about that here. Just watch kids walk. Just watch them walk. You've seen a kid walk? This is how a kid walks. He's like, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm leaning, I'm leaning over here, I'm leaning over here, and then boom, down he goes, right? Now you see a kid do that, and that's adorable, all right? I mean, that's, that's cute. I mean, it, as long as he doesn't get hurt. As long as, as long as he doesn't get hurt, and as long as it's not your kid who's crying in you know, public or something. Uh, it's adorable. It's funny. What's not funny is when an adult does that. You ever seen an adult do that? I'm walking and leaning and leaning, and then, you know, kaboom, there they go. Uh, that's not cute, right? That's, that's, that's just sad is what that is. Not cute at all. Instability is part of the immaturity that we have that, that God wants to work on in our lives. Back to the Shel Silverstein poem. One day we said to grow up brown, hey, why don't you try growing down? Then grow up brown, he scrunched and frowned and scratched his head and walked around. And finally he said with a helpless sound, maybe I will try growing down. So grow down, so grow up brown began to sing and started doing silly things. He started making weirdy faces and came in first in three-legged races. All day he swung from monkey bars. All night he'd lie and count the stars. He tooted horns, he banged on drums, he spent 20 bucks on chewing gum. He flew a kite, he kicked a can, he rubbed some dirt upon his hands. He drew some pictures, threw some stones, ate 47 ice cream cones. He climbed a roof, though no one asked. He broke his wrist, he wore a cast. He rolled down hills, he climbed up trees, he scuffed his elbows, skinned his knees. He tried to join the baseball team. When they said no, he spit and screamed. He cried and when he was feeling sad and went and cuddled with his dad. He wore a hat that didn't fit. He learned just how far he could spit. He learned to wrestle and get tickled. Sucked his thumb. He belched and giggled. Now, I, I, I'm all for a child, you know, staying as youthful and childlike in your adult years as possible. Kind of this childish outlook, but not childish activity, right? right? I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He said in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I talked like a child. When I, I, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. The, 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 the instability, the foolishness, the the ignorance that comes with youthfulness. Perhaps nothing then is as dangerous and as disastrous as a person who comes to know Christ as their Savior and thinks that right away they've now they've come to maturity in Christ. They, they've, they've grown up and they've reached maturity right away. It'd be, like a, it'd be like a first grader on his first day, right? In his first hour, standing up and saying, well, I think that about does it. Thank you very much for the education. I'm ready to graduate, you know? Just foolishness. There's so much that you need to learn. Or it'd be like a young Christian who has some powerful spiritual experience with God and counts that as his or her passport 
to Christian maturity. That's dangerous. That's a picture of instability. And when Paul now develops this idea of instability, he's speaking of instability of someone who is immature, right? Someone who, uh, who is lifted up by every gust and gale of wind and turned around and swaying this way and that by every, everybody who claims to be teaching something. And that leads us to the second impediment to growth. Not just instability, but gullibility. Notice it with me. Verse 14 again. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Listen, those who deceive know what they're doing. Uh, They are cunning They are crafty, and they they prey upon the gullibility of people who are just hoping for some kind of hope. And spiritually desperate people are great victims, right? Spiritually desperate people are gullible people. They are susceptible to all kinds of things, and opportunists prey upon the gullibility of people. Let me just give you a kind of almost a silly example of it, and one with where the stakes aren't terribly high necessarily. But, but, but did you know, for example, um, did you know that for about $25, you can buy four ounces of triple blessed holy water? Oh, yes. Yes, you can. I'm sure you'll be rushing online to buy it after I'm done telling you about it. It's true. For 25 bucks on eBay, or it's, also, I also, it's on Amazon and Etsy too. They also sell it, right? It, you can buy Father Farley's triple blessed holy water. Woohoo! Right? Tri- triple blessed, not just blessed holy water, not just holy water, but blessed holy water. And not once, but twice, three times blessed holy water. There's a, on the label, it says this it's quote, quote, perfect for healing, exorcisms, blessings, sin removal. Warding off vampires, demons, Satan, witches, warlocks, and the undead. Not to forget the monster hiding under your child's bed or in their closet. Contains 100% pure holy water, blessed by three priests and one cardinal. Well, there you go. And, but wait, that's not all. If you order now, you get triple, the triple blessed holy water. I mean, right <laughs> I mean, the, the scams. Now, so here, here's where I'm coming from. I'm not sure which is sadder, that people are trying to sell this or that people are actually buying it, that people are actually purchasing this. And here's what I'm thinking. How do we, how do we get to the point that somebody buys something like this when we move towards isolation, when we're out of community, when we don't have brothers and sisters around us helping us? Because that's what they're there for. As we maintain the bond of peace as we're with one another, we're, we're, we're more protected. It's like we're, we're not the weak one in the, all by himself. We're in, we're in a herd. We're together with one another. I think this is why Paul says to make every effort to keep the bond of peace between us. We need each other. Church, we need each other. You need the people around you today. Do you know that? You need them. We need each other's gifts. God has given things to you that he wants you to share with the people around you. I love verse 7 of the text. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And so so the grace gifts that Christ has given me, I'm to use to be a blessing in your life. I'm, I'm I'm to share my gifts with you. Verse 11 and 12 says, so Christ himself gave, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, The pastors and teachers to what? To equip his people for works of service so that the body may be built up. That's why he gave these people, right? And then then he gives grace gifts to the rest of God's people, right? He gave gifts to you. And it's your job to share your gifts with me and everybody else. Listen to what he says in scripture. We support one another. He says, from him, the whole body joined and held together 
by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We support each other by using what God has given us and the result is maturity for the whole body. Isn't this just really a beautiful picture? Again, the, the, the metaphor uh, and, and, and the movement in the text, the body and maturity. What a beautiful picture for us as the church today. And all of this is made possible. All of this because Jesus Christ came to be our Savior. You know, I was thinking about this and I thought, I put the question this way. How is it that we can grow up? How is it that we can grow up and mature? Because Christ grew down. (laughs) Because Jesus, God's son, the epitome of maturity and fullness, the son of God, came down. He descended to earth, right? He, the eternal, became an embryo. The strong became weak. And how far did he come? He entered the womb of a virgin. He became an infant. He became a napias, right? Jesus. Immaturity, instability, gullibility. Verse 9 says, What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. That literally means the depths of the earth. The one who was on high, the one who was fully mature, who had all knowledge and understanding and wisdom, became a child, became immature, became young, so that we could grow up. And so how is it that we can have unity in the bond of peace? How is it that we can be unified because he at the cross was torn apart? How is it that we can have unity in the bond of peace because he was torn apart at the cross at the hands of violent men, violent sinners who placed him on the cross and buried him in the tomb? That's how. That was the price of our unity. You know, doesn't that frame things for you and me? So when he says to fight for, to maintain, to keep, to guard your unity, it's because Jesus' blood was spilled so we could have it. Church. So church, let's give thanks for the grace that was given to each one of us. Let's give thanks to God for the grace. Let's celebrate that God gave grace to you and to you and to you and to each one of us. And then let's ask for the help of Jesus, the head, to fight for the bond of peace that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, for the bond of peace that you spilled your blood to purchase for us. Thank you that you who were fully mature and high and powerful became weak and small and vulnerable Thank you, Lord. Now we pray that through this word, you would have done your work in us to grow us up, to teach us, to lead us down the path of maturity so that the church can be built up and be the beautiful thing that you you say it is. So help each one of us, Lord, now to know our part and, and to not diminish either our part or the part of another who's a part of this body, but to celebrate all the various gifts you've given. Thank you, Lord. Encourage your church today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God's peace be with you.